Welcome to Namak Vitalik Podcast, where we respect fashion's past, analyze fashion's present, and get excited about fashion's future. I'm Liberty Impop, founder and creative principal of fashion media company Manic Vitalik. Several times per week, I'll bring you episodes about exciting things happening in fashion, discussion about current issues facing the industry, and the places and people that have made the fashion industry great. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on Instagram at the Medical Talent Podcast and at Medical Talent, both linked in our show notes. Now, let's get into today's episode. Welcome back to the Medical Talent Podcast. I'm Liberty, your host. One thing that I did a ton of while I had COVID in September was reading. I caught up on my New Yorker issues. I caught up on my issues of Vanity Fair and The Atlantic. And more recently, I've begun going to my local library again to check out books. It won't surprise you then that today we're going to be talking about words. More specifically, we're going to be talking about the importance of writing and literature to fashion. Let's get to it. I'm going to start by talking about my love of books and written work, which started at a very young age. When I was three years old, I was reading newspapers upside down, or so I was told by my parents. How would I remember? I was a toddler. (laughs) About a few years later, around ages five to seven, I'd hang out at my grandma and my aunt's house. My aunt took care of my grandma, so they lived together. And there were always magazines around. Cosmopolitan, Southern Living, People Magazine, and National Enquirer. Weekly World News, Better Homes and Gardens. So a healthy mix of home magazines, celebrity tabloids, and a women's interest magazine for good measure. Around age eight, I started to become interested in fashion and I began reading fashion magazines soon after that. I became a sports fan at age 12. I'll tell you, it's hard being an Atlanta sports fan, but that conversation is for another day. And when I became a sports fan, I began a journey of obsessively reading sports columns and box scores in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I also read teen magazines like J14, which I was obsessed with. I'd tear the music posters from it and I'd plaster them on my bedroom wall. My wall was also covered in fashion magazine ads from Vogue magazine, which I honestly can't remember if... That was the only fashion magazine that I read as a teen or not. I think it was. This whole time, I was voraciously taking in what seemed like every book from the school library. We had a program in elementary school called the Accelerated Reader Program, which gave each book in the library a certain points value. I was determined to be the end of year winner for getting the most points because the winner got prizes. And sure enough, when I was in fourth grade, I actually won. I got a brand new bike and a boombox, and I was super psyched. I bring that up, though, because that process, though there were prizes given, reinforced in me a love of reading that has managed to follow me throughout life. And when I got to high school, suddenly, I turned out to be this really good writer. Probably because, and I believe this to be true, The more that you read, the better of a writer that you become. And I must say that it crushes me to see that in today's fashion industry, but also in today's society as a whole, the acts of reading and writing are being sidelined in favor of short quips on social media. Now, I know that stories can be told in a number of ways, books and written articles being two ways and videos being another, but... In this rapid embrace of a landscape that heavily favors social media, we really do lose a lot of nuance in the work that we put out. But I want to hop on to a few of my favorite fashion books, some of them I've read recently. So first on the list is Gods and Kings, The Rise and Fall of Alexander McQueen and John Galliano by Dana Thomas. I own a physical copy of it, and it was actually one of the first ever fashion books that I read. I also loved Fashionopolis, The Price of Fast Fashion and the Future of Clothes, also by Dana Thomas. Now, this one was an audible book. I like to listen to audiobooks sometimes when I'm on a treadmill, so this was a good way to do that. By the way, Dana Thomas is a masterful journalist, just so you know. 
If you're looking for a way to learn how to properly tell an engaging story that holds the reader's attention and gives a maximum amount of knowledge along the way, read anything that she's written. The Battle of Versailles was absolutely spectacular. In it, the always talented Robert Gavon paints a vivid picture of both the Battle of Versailles behind the scenes and the fashion event itself. I read it in two days because I couldn't put it down. And of course, I own a physical copy of it. It's one of my treasured belongings now. The Price of Illusion by Joan Juliet Buck, the ex-editor-in-chief of French Vogue. That was one that I listened to on Audible as well. Fashion Climbing by Bo Cunningham, another Audible listen. Now, recently, I did a review for Manic Metallic of Amy O'Dell's book, Anna, the Biography. So I own a physical copy of that one, and that was a pretty well-written book. I mean, I, I had my feelings about it. You know, some were positive and some not as positive, but overall, I think that Amy did a great job at giving us an idea of who Anna is behind the scenes. And of course, there are a few more, you know, Champagne Supernovas, that was Maureen Callahan. The Chiffon Trenches, Andre Leontale's autobiography, which I own a physical copy of. But here's one that I want to talk about. The Vanity Fair Diaries by Tina Brown. I don't own this one. I didn't listen to it on Audible. It's way too big of a book. How could you listen to that on Audible or any audio for that matter? I borrowed this from the library. Now, something worth mentioning about this book is just how deep of a look that it gives us into the inner workings of the 1980s and early 1990s era of Vanity Fair, not to mention of one of the most important media personalities of that time. I found Tina Brown reading through the Vanity Fair Diaries. I found her to be relatable to myself as someone that has high standards and insists on intelligent work that doesn't skimp on quality. This is the type of book that everyone needs to read if you hope to be in the fashion industry, and even if you're already there. One thing that is painfully obvious about today's fashion industry set is that it has no sense of history whatsoever. Fashion today is very much hyper-focused on the here and now, and that includes an emphasis on social media, and fashion is also focused on the future. However, I'm not so certain that anyone in today's fashion industry knows where this industry is going. And they don't really have an ability to form an intelligent hypothesis about it either because many people coming up in today's fashion era have no idea where and what fashion came from. Whether that's the important people that made things happen, the designers, models, editors, and executives that ran things, what have you. Now, what Tina Brown did by publishing these diaries is she did us all a favor by documenting a -a one-of-a-kind era, the likes of which we will never see again. And we need to heed what's in it so that we can use that knowledge to move fashion ahead in a way that works for everyone. Let's work smarter, not harder. So how about where good fashion criticism stands today? Now, I'm actually going to be a little bit self-referential here and say that one of Manic Metallic's recent articles, The Plight of the Fashion Journalist, gives a great discussion of the challenges that fashion journalists face today. We also discussed the article in episode 26 of the podcast, if you'd rather listen to it. But either way, definitely check it out. I do want to spotlight, though, why general interest publications seem to have some of the best writing, even as it relates to fashion writing. I've got a passage from our article that I mentioned, and I'm going to read it. Here we go. It depends on where one looks for fashion journalists. If you're looking at Vogue, Elle, and other mainstream fashion magazines, then you're not likely to find that intellectual depth and rigor for reasons that are not really a secret to those familiar with the industry. One cannot go to bed with advertisers and come up with good journalism. Besides, journalists at these outlets are afraid of being unwelcome at the fashion shows and presentations of the designers that they would be prospectively critiquing. And with Fashion Week's cosplaying as mean girls at least twice a year, separating the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, these journalists must make Fashion Week appearances. And they must maintain cordial relationships with their advertising partners, lest they lose a massive source of funding for their enterprises. It's much easier for fashion journalists that work at outlets such as 
Business of Fashion, WWD, The New York Times, and The Washington Post, along with those that choose to remain independent fashion media entities such as Mike Metallic, to maintain a sense of autonomy from fashion designers and large conglomerates because the aforementioned companies did not necessarily depend on advertisements for such a large share of their revenue. Upsetting a designer or a brand with an unfavorable, but fair, of course, review for that season's collection does not have to be a worry that crosses any of those journalists' minds, end quote. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that topic. What's happening in fashion journalism right now? Why are critics afraid to criticize? Send me an email at hello at manicmetallic.com or DM me on Instagram at manicmetallic. Let me know what you think. I'll admit that in overseeing Manic Metallic, it's hard to keep up with the work of other journalists on a regular basis. What I've seen in most mainstream outlets, though, isn't exactly promising in terms of the direction that fashion journalism is headed. There are a few that I admire these days, though. I think that they're some of the best writers and journalists out there today. Robin Gavon of the Washington Post leads off my list. Eugene Rapkin of Style Zeitgeist is next. Dana Thomas, I mentioned a couple of her books above, Fashionopolis and Gods and Kings. Amy O'Dell, of course, she wrote Anna the Biography. And she also has a really excellent sub stack. I subscribe to it myself. And I'll also give an honorable mention to Vanessa Friedman because when I was sick during September and couldn't watch the various fashion weeks myself, it was her work for the Times that kept me in the loop as to what was going on. So thank you, Vanessa, for your constant hard work and attention to detail. As we get to the end of this podcast episode, I want to say that I no longer have any patience at all for people's short attention spans. I've loved reading and writing since I was a child, and I will not allow Manic Metallic to devolve into a company that waters down its quality and cuts the length of its various pieces of work because Johnny here couldn't be bothered to read more than 10 words. There are plenty of people, again, as I mentioned in The Plight of the Fashion Journalist, read that if you haven't already, that still love long-form fashion journalism that is in-depth, thoughtful, and truthful. And I'm at a point where I will no longer spare any measure of attention in concerning myself with those that don't respect the very basic skills of reading and writing. I've been conflicted for a while about whether or not to have Manic Metallic indulge those that have zero interest in what we're offering to the field, which is good quality, in-depth, and many times lengthy work that has a pretty definite point of view. And if those people choose not to indulge us in taking the time and care to read through our work that we put so much time and effort into, then Manic Metallic will no longer attempt to indulge them in creating bite-sized content for their five-second consuming pleasure. Does this all mean that we will not be doing any more social media posts for our various channels? By no means does it mean that. But when we do it, we will do it on our own terms, and it will be work that we will be proud to release. If you find it, you enjoy it, then you're probably a good fit for our audience. If you don't, then maybe we're not a good fit. But Manic Metallic will certainly be there to welcome you if you are a match for the type of work that we put out for the fashion industry. And that's going to be it for this episode. Can't wait for episode 35. I want to get into a conversation about sustainability. What about sustainability? Well, you'll just have to wait and see. Catch you then. Thanks for listening. If you got value out of today's episode, it'd mean a lot to me if you rate, review, and subscribe to the Manic Metallic Podcast. Be sure to tell all of your fashion inclined friends and co-workers about the podcast as well. This would really help us to spread our message about fashion being an art, discipline, and force for societal change. And don't forget to stay in touch with us by subscribing to the Manic Metallic newsletter and following us on Instagram. Feel free to reach out to us through either of those means. I'd love to hear from you. I'll link these all in the show notes. You're the best. See you next episode.